you. And thank you all for coming. It is a, a, a genuine pleasure to be back in Chapel Hill, one of my very favorite places. I mean, you have the cosmopolitan sort of secret, American secret weapon of the college town uh, combined with uh, all the brown liquor and smoked meat. And uh, those are all my favorite things. So I've been thoroughly enjoying myself, and uh, it's a real treat to see all of you and to be back here in, in Chapel Hill. So I want to start off today talking a little bit about metaphors, which are obviously very useful things to have, but uh, you can get into trouble with metaphors. They can be very misleading. Um, so that's not a trash can. Uh, you can drag files, which aren't files, and folders, which aren't folders, into it and empty it, but the files aren't gone because this isn't a trash can and those weren't files. They were just entries in a file system, uh, a database that said if you want to find a file called secret plan dot doc, you look in the following sectors, and that keeps the other files, which are also not files, from being written onto those sectors so that your file doesn't accident accidentally get trashed. And once again, that's not a trash can. <laughs> when you delete secret plan dot doc by dragging it into the trash, your computer just erases its entry in that file system table, but anyone who knows where to look can find it, as innumerable criminal suspects have discovered when the cops seize their computers and subject them to forensic analysis. So this is a problem, we call it metaphor debt. Uh, metaphors extend easy credit to us in the form of these easy to grasp abstractions we can lay hands on and use to manipulate uh, uh, technical difficult things. But then they extract a fee in the form of a shear between those handles that we use to move stuff around and the underlying technical reality of what that stuff actually is. And metaphor debt is a very toxic form of debt because it's impossible to estimate how much interest you're accumulating on that debt until it's too late. And this is a very particular problem in technology because technology subsists on abstractions and metaphors. We don't reach into our computer and twiddle our zeros and ones with tools we've you know, gnawed out of wood. We operate in bits that we abstract to bytes, that we abstract to operators, that we abstract to high-level programming languages, that we abstract to GUIs, that we abstract to these fat-fingered presses on our smeary capacitive touchscreens. Now, the 1980s, they were a boundless source of metaphor debt. And in the 1980s, there were these two competing standards for TV uh, in the EU and, and other parts of the world. They had something called PAL, and here and in Canada, we had something called NTSC, which stood for never twice the same color. And um, this allowed studios to stagger their releases because all they needed to do was release their videos in different incompatible formats. And it didn't matter whether there was a rule about whether you could bring a video home from Europe you couldn't play it on your American TV because it was encoded with an incompatible uh, uh, encoding scheme. But then along came DVD players, and DVD players, they're digital, so they can output anything you want, PAL or NTSC, and that made release windowing hard. And the same uh, token, you had things like Dreamcast. Uh, digital multi-protocol -pro video out outputs also posed problems for the console market. Uh, the manufacturers, they were accustomed to windowing their releases as well, and they also had this very sweet racket in the form of extracting duplication fees from uh, their uh, software vendors. If you wanted to make a game for Dreamcast, um, you uh, had to approach Dreamcast for permission to use their CD presses in order to press the CD, and they would take this otherwise commodity function and they would mark it up at an enormous markup and kind of uh, put a little money in their pocket for every game made, even if it was never sold. Now, this is a very sweet racket for, uh, for Sega. Uh, and, um, you know, it was a bit of a rent uh, collection on the software developers. Uh, and the Dreamcast was designed to reject a CD that was printed on a commodity press. It had to be printed on Sega's special press. Uh, so standing in the, you could collect rent by just standing in the middle of the market, doing nothing except for fulfilling this commodity function and uh, marking it up. But there's a problem with this, because at root, uh, the Sega and the movie studios were, had this metaphor debt, because a DVD player is not a VHS cassette player whose cassettes happen to be flat round discs. And it, it, it is a uh, uh, general purpose Turing complete von Neumann architecture computer, and it is capable of expressing any program that we can uh, express in, in symbolic logic, and it's attached to an optical drive. Uh, and a Dreamcast is not a pinball machine in an exotic small plastic case. It too is a general purpose, Turing complete, von Neumann architecture computer capable of executing any instruction that we can express in, sub in symbolic logic that is also attached to an optical drive. So in 1998, Congress sat, set out to solve 
the problem that uh, Sega and the, the DVD players were having. Uh, they, and they turned this metaphor debt into a law uh, called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. You probably know it as the author of all your favorite videos. The DMCA has caused this video to be removed from the internet. Uh, that's section 512. Uh, section 1201 of the DMCA, uh, uh, section 1201 of the DMCA is the anti-circumvention section. It says that uh, if you bypass an effective means of an access control to a copyrighted work, you commit an offense. If you do it commercially, you commit a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense. And the purpose of this odd bit of jargon, this effective means of access control, was to ensure that you couldn't take that von Neumann architecture, Turing complete, uh, cap computer capable of expressing any, or, or executing any ex instruction we could express symbolically, and ask it to, express, uh, to execute instructions that pissed off the manufacturer of the device. So here's how that works. We're gonna do a bit of a, a, a quick uh, crypto primer. Uh, in crypto, we have Alice and Bob and Carol. Uh, <laughs> Alice and Bob, uh, they're the good guys. They wanna talk to each other. And Carol is nefarious. She wants to get in the middle and, and eavesdrop on them. And um, the, the way that you build a system that Alice and Bob can use to talk to each other without Carol listening in is um, you create a program uh, that uh, embodies some kind of uh, cryptographic protocol, some math for scrambling information, uh, and you publish that information as widely as possible, which if you're not a cryptographer or security professional at first may seem a bit uh, uh, odd to you. Why would you tell people how your security system works? Surely this helps them unravel it. And the answer to that is, is in something that is actually grounded in, in any scholarly discipline and really comes to us through 500 years of the Enlightenment. So before the Enlightenment, what looked like science was alchemy. Alchemy shares a lot of ground with science. The way an alchemist does uh, his business, they were, they were he's mostly, uh, is he observes some phenomenon in the world, he hypothesizes a, a, a causal relationship between that phenomenon, this causes that. He designs an experiment to evaluate whether or not his causal relationship uh, is, is real. And that's where it, start, it looks just like science, but then it, it, ta it takes a fork away from science because the alchemist doesn't tell anyone what he thinks he's found out. He doesn't subject himself to adversarial peer review. This is when your friends gently point out the mistakes you've made and your enemies call you an idiot for having made them. And instead, the alchemist assumes that he's so smart that he can't possibly be fooling himself. This is how alchemists discover for themselves in the hardest way possible that you shouldn't drink mercury. Uh, <laughs> and, and alchemists eventually did convert something base into something precious. They converted superstition to knowledge creation through the process of publication. And the way that you find out whether or not your cipher works is you tell other people how it works. Uh, and they tell you whether or not you made a dumb mistake. And so that's how we get good, robust ciphers. So Alice and Bob, first they, they use a cipher that's widely published to scramble their message. But this raises this important question. If, if they've just explained to Carol what math they're using to scramble their message, how do they stop Carol from intercepting the message? Well, um, they have a key, and the key is hidden. And the ciphers that we use today, they're so well designed that if you never give the key to your adversary, your adversary can never guess the key. And when I say never, I mean like, if you convert all the hydrogen atoms in the universe into computers, and you set them to work trying to guess what key you might have used, and you wait until the heat death of the universe, <laughs> you run out of universe before you run out of possible keys. And so Alice and Bob feel pretty good about the fact that they've told Carol how they scrambled their message, because they kept to keep their key a secret. Uh, one other thing they don't keep a secret is they don't keep the existence of the message a secret. It used to be that we spent a lot of time trying to keep messages themselves a secret. Um, you know, the Caesars would uh, shave their, message, their, their messengers' heads and tattoo messages on them and then let their hair grow back in and send them across the empire to deliver their edicts. But today we assume that Carol, whoops. Sorry about that, wardrobe malfunction. These things always make me feel like Madonna and or Janet Jackson. <laughs> uh, that, that, um, the, the, uh, today we assume that Carol can always get a copy of the message because today we transmit our messages through public uh, uh, messaging uh, environments, right? So we use the internet, which means that like, if Carol is your ISP, she can probably see the message. Uh, if Carol is in the same room as your Wi-Fi hotspot, she can get the message. If Carol is in the same continent that the satellite link you're using, 
uh, blanket with the message. She can get the message. So if we can design a, a message security protocol that works even if you know how the cipher works, and even if you can intercept a copy of the message after it's been scrambled, then you have a very robust algorithm. And crypto works. Crypto is amazing. That's why the FBI is freaking out about crypto, because crypto actually, no fooling, works. But in the model of the DMCA, we have a kind of voodoo crypto. And, and in voodoo crypto, we just have Alice and Bob. And here's how that works. Um, say you're Netflix, right? You're Bob. And Alice is your customer. And you want to send Alice a movie, but you want to make sure that Alice doesn't save the movie to her hard drive and share it with her friends. And so you want to scramble the movie before you send it to Alice. But Alice won't be your customer <coughs> unless she can descramble the movie because it's not much fun watching a scrambled movie. Uh, and so you have to give Alice the key, because without the key, even if you have all the, all the hydrogen atoms in the universe working for you, you can't unscramble the movie. So Netflix hides the key in a program they give to Alice. And then they anticipate that even though Alice can take this program and subject it to whatever depredation she feels will help her extract the key, that Alice will never find that key. Now, there's a technical name for this in security practice. It's called wishful thinking. <laughs> right? Even really good bank safes are kept in bank vaults, not in bank robbers' living rooms. If you hide keys in equipment that you give to your adversary, and then you say to your adversary, go wherever you want and do whatever you want to recover the keys, your adversary is going to recover the keys eventually. Um, even the best efforts we have, you know, Apple uh, has probably the best key management in the world with their secure coprocessors and their iPhones. Uh, they, those secure keys seem to have leaked to a company that supplies law enforcement. Now, it's tempting to think that that company must be really good at what it does, except that it appears that they got hacked by a group of small-time grifters who are now blackmailing them for Bitcoin, or they're going to release the keys to the world, right? So this idea that like you can be so smart that you can come up with a way of hiding things that no one is smarter than you and will find, that's alchemy, not science. So the DMCA the, the, uh, had to, in some way, uh, oh no, let me, let me uh, um, no, no, okay, let me tell you briefly about the DMCA and how it solves this problem. Um, so to solve this problem, uh, the DMCA uh, created a prohibition on investigating systems that protected copyrights, and they created a prohibition on publishing the results of those investigations. So the way that they solved this problem was they said, if you're a Netflix customer, and Netflix supplies you with some software for your own computer, or if you buy a uh, device that has some other uh, kind of uh, crypto in it to stop people from accessing copyrighted works without authorization, like a phone or a console, then looking too hard at that device is unlawful, and providing someone with the tools to look at that device is unlawful. Again, it's a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine. But it's important to note here that what the DMCA was protecting was not copyright itself. Right? If, if you go to India or Europe or Mexico, some other territory where you can buy a DVD for more cheaply than you can buy it here. And you walk into a store on a high street and you find an authorized copy of that DVD that has been made available by the rights holder and you approach the shopkeeper and you ask them how many rupees or euros or pesos that, that DVD costs and they tell you the price and you take that money out of your pocket and you hand it to them. And then you come back to Chapel Hill and you put that DVD in your DVD player. You have not committed an act of copyright infringement. You have committed the opposite of copyright infringement. Paying the rights holder for their works at the price they specified in order to view the work is the actual, literal, non-hyperbolic opposite of copyright infringement, <laughs> right? Now, if you make a game for the Sega Dreamcast, or, you know, the current generation of Nintendo, and you sell it to me, and I play it on my console, we have not committed an act of copyright infringement, even though you didn't cut the App Store in, or Nintendo in, or, or, or Microsoft in, for a piece of the action. It is not an act of copyright infringement to create a copyrighted work and sell it to someone so that they can enjoy it on a computer they own. It is the literal, non-hyperbolic opposite of copyright infringement. So this is where metaphor debt becomes a kind of metaphor sheer. Um, 
because a computer designed not to do something that the manufacturer dislikes isn't the same as a computer that's incapable of doing a thing that the manufacturer dislikes. It's a computer that refuses to do things that the manufacturer doesn't like. It's not an incapable computer, it's a disobedient computer. It's a computer <coughs> whose watchword is, I can't let you do that, Dave. <laughs> now, to make this model work, you have to declare war on the very idea of general purpose computing. Turing completeness, it's a very hard thing to get away from, this idea that once you make a computer, it can run all the programs. Before we had Turing completeness, we did have these very specialized computers. If you wanted to calculate a ballistics table, you built one computer, kind of a giant elaborate pinball machine, right? And then if you wanted to calculate an actuarial table, you built a different kind of computer. But with the advent of general purpose computing, we discovered something that at first seemed very hard and then seemed very hard to get away from. Turing completeness, this, this ability of computers to calculate and compute all, com all programs, is very hard to get away from. People keep trying because for security reasons, it would be great if you could design a printer that couldn't be infected with viruses. <laughs> but as it turns out, once you put enough smarts in that computer to parse out a, an image and turn it into a page, you give it enough smarts to uh, run all the programs. And you see this every summer at the hacker conferences, you know, DEF CON and, and every Christmas at CCC and so on, where inevitably someone gets up on stage and says, someone fielded this social network, right? And they created a toy programming language so that you could animate glittery unicorn GIFs, I pronounce it GIF, uh, <laughs> on your screen. It had four instructions to animate the unicorn. I sat down and stared very hard at these instructions and figured out how to write a virus with them. <laughs> and now I've infected all the pages on this social network, right? This is a recurring motif in computer science. Magic the Gathering, the card game. <coughs> Given enough cards and enough time is Turing complete, right? You can run Photoshop on a large enough deck of Magic, magic the Gathering cards. It may take you millions of years, but if you really, really want to draw you know, a box around another thing or, or do a little uh, Gaussian blur, you can, with enough Magic the Gathering cards and enough friends and enough, and enough time, uh, affect that using, this, uh, using, using Magic the Gathering. But half-smart half -smart regulators are trapped in the metaphor, right? They're trapped in, in um, the idea that maybe we can design a computer that can run all the programs except for the one that causes a policy problem. So think about the crypto wars, which I alluded to earlier. We are still mired in this, in this fight that we've been having since the Clinton era. A lot of this stuff goes back to the Clinton era, DMCA and so on. It's kind of ground zero for a lot of this stuff. So since the Clinton era, law enforcement has been saying, once you give us a tool that is capable of scrambling a message effectively, then you lock out law enforcement from unscrambling that message. It's true, right? That is, that is the whole point. So what they say is, there must be a way to design a computer that can run all the programs except for the one that scrambles messages so thoroughly that we can't decrypt them. And we don't know how to make that computer. Um, you know, this has not uh, in any way abated in the decades since this debate started. Uh, last year, the Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, when confronted with um, uh, expert testimony from software developers who said that we don't know how to make this computer that you've asked us to make. And we also don't know how to make a cipher system that works perfectly when a criminal is trying to break into it, but fails catastrophically when a policeman is trying to break into it. <laughs> I'm not gonna do the accent, but he said, the laws, of, uh, the laws of mathematics are very commendable, but I assure you that the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia, right? <laughs> we, we continue to have this metaphor here where Someone says, make me a computer that can run most of the programs, and law, enfor law enforcement and government, they hear, like, make me a car that doesn't have a hands-free phone in it, and uh, because that we found them to be dangerous, and when the, when, when the engineers hear that, they, they hear, make me a car whose wheels won't spin if you're driving away from a bank robbery, and they say, we don't know how to make those wheels, right? Maybe there's a nexus for control somewhere in this, in this machine, but it's not the wheels. It's not the Turing completeness. If you have an idea for making a computer almost Turing complete, there are a lot of people who would be very happy to fund it. We don't know how to make that computer. Uh, in 2017, uh, the deputy AG Rod Rosenstein said, uh, responsible encryption is achievable. 
Responsible encryption can involve effective, secure encryption that allows easy access only with judicial authorization. So they think that the nerds are just mulishly refusing to bend on a matter of principle. They think they can just shout, hey, you nerds, nerd harder. <laughs> and then we'll figure out how to make crypto that works ba when bad guys are trying to hack our pacemakers and our finances and our automobiles and our seismic dampers and our airplanes, but doesn't uh, work when it's the police. They are convinced that this impossible thing is possible. And when powerful people demand, impossible uh, demand the impossible, terrible things happen. They, when they force us to swallow a fly, we then have to swallow a bird to catch the, a spider to catch the fly, and then we have to swallow a bird and a cat and a dog and a horse and a cow, and then we know how that story ends. So think of what it would take to keep criminals from using working encryption. Well, first, we would have to stop anyone who entered the country from bringing in a computer that could run all the programs. And then we would have to have a national firewall with a whitelist of websites that don't distribute working cryptography. And then we would have to have a ban on significant chunks of what we currently teach to computer science students so that they couldn't just sit down and write working crypto. And then we would have to confiscate all the Turing complete computers that we have and replace them with kind of North Korean equivalents that were also Turing complete but had some spyware that tried to make sure that you weren't running crypto on them. So the disobedient computer, it's the worst kind of technology debt we have. It's the kind of debt that mounts up compute, uh, uh, compound interest. Because for a disobedient computer to work, it has to be sneaky. Right? If, if they have to lie. If, um, if, if you tried to copy a CD or save a Netflix file and your computer popped up a dialog box that said, I can't let you do that, Dave, and there was a program on your desktop labeled HAL9000.exe, you would drag that program into the trash. Right? So in order for this to work, in order for there to be programs resident on your computer that stop you from doing things you want to do, your computer has to run those programs in a way that you can't detect, that you can't interdict, and the files associated with those programs have to be in places that you can't see. So this is a really bad idea from computer security perspective, because if a bad guy can figure out how to run code that looks like uh, the code that's supposed to stop you from doing the stuff the manufacturer doesn't like, then that bad guy can run that code in a way that your computer can't see, can't stop, and deliberately hides from you. And this is not a hypothetical example. In fact, just before Halloween 2005, I was here in Chapel Hill, and Mary Beth Peters, the Register of Copyrights, was on a panel. And I stood up and I, and I said to her, Ms. Peters, we just had the news that Sony BMG uh, sent out six million audio CDs, 51 titles, that when you put them in your CD drive, overwrote your computer's operating system so that it could no longer see programs that began with this odd string, dollar sign, <coughs> SYS, dollar sign. And then they wrote a program into your computer, into its startup folder that started with that string. And uh, that program tried to stop you from ripping CDs. But any program that started with that string, once they modified your operating system, could run with impunity. And uh, 300,000 US government and military networks were eventually infected with this rootkit. And virus writers immediately started prepending their viruses <coughs> with this string, because there was this kind of autoimmune deficiency among our computers, where they couldn't, their antibodies could no longer see malware, parasites, pathogens, that had this little characteristic that was not hard for malicious actors to use. It is a really bad idea to design computers so that their owners can't figure out what's going on. Um, the uh, advent of uh, the idea that we must solve the problem of Turing completeness uh, turns uh, disobedient computers into features instead of bugs. Uh, every company, after all, could make more money for their shareholders if it was illegal for you to use your computer in a way that frustrated the shareholders' interests and, and required you to uh, arrange your affairs so that your interests were subservient to the bottom line of the company that made the device that you're using. And since computers are in more and more devices, right? the general purpose computer means that everything that we use eventually just becomes a computer in a fancy case, whether that's a skyscraper or an airplane or a car or a pacemaker. Um, uh, every manufacturer has this enormous temptation to slide into their device a computer whose sole purpose is to implement the minimum viable copyright access control 
to invoke Section 12.1 of the DMCA such that in order to use it to benefit you instead of the shareholders, you have to bypass it. So if you want to plug a uh, uh, third-party part into your car or your tractor, um, you need to bypass a technical protection measure before the car will recognize the part. There's no copyright infringement in installing a part in your engine, right? But because there is a copyrighted work, the software that checks to see whether the part came from the original manufacturer, and because there's a technical protection measure, the manufacturers like GM say that installing that third-party third part is a copyright infringement. We're like one vision system away from a toaster that won't toast unauthorized bread, right? <laughs> We're one RFID away from a dishwasher that won't toast non-manufacturer approved dishes, or they won't wash them, rather. So um, imagine what it would mean if a car could sell you, if a car company could sell you a car whose USB charger only took approved USB devices. And if there was enormous market control and, and consolidation, and anyone who wanted to sell you a device that you could charge from your cigarette lighter had to pay a ransom to the car manufacturer. What car manufacturer wouldn't like that? In fact, we kind of know what that model looks like because that was what the phone company looked like for a long time. AT&T had this deal where if you wanted to plug something into the phone network, you had to get their approval or face criminal sanctions for endangering our nation's telecommunications infrastructure. And they took this very seriously because if you wanted to get something approved to plug into the network, you had to pay them a royalty, right? So it was an enormous source of profit. They took it so seriously that they banned this. This is called the Hushaphone. It's a plastic cup that goes around your phone's mouthpiece so that you could talk into your phone without other people hearing your words. And they argued that this plastic cup endangered the phone network. And this was finally a bridge too far for their regulators who said, I'm sorry, you have to let people plug other stuff into the phone system. This is how we get answering machines and fax machines and eventually modems and the internet. Um, do you remember in the era when we still had landlines, if you wanted to get caller ID, the phone company treated that as a monetizable feature that you could only get if you paid them for it and that a third party couldn't give you. Right? The equivalent to that is like if your email provider said you can, you can see who's emailing you at, after you open the email. But if you want to see the from line before you open the email, it's $1.50 a month. Right? That is what the model in which manufacturers get to decide which value you can have looks like. So this is how network neutrality opponents advance their cause. They analogize the internet to a cable system, and they ask why they shouldn't be able to charge more money for more channels. But the internet is a general purpose network, that's why. It's not a glorified video on demand system. It's not even the world's greatest pornography distribution system. It's not a jihadi recruiting tool. It's the nervous system of the 21st century. And we live in a time where everything we do involves the internet, and we are heading for a time where everything we do is going to require the internet. And the only way to make regulating it like entertainment technology seem reasonable is if you deploy these weaponized bad metaphors. So the Section 12.1 of the DMCA invites companies to see opportunities for lockdown everywhere they look. Uh, inkjet printers are a good example of this. In March 2016, HP pushed out a security update to tens of millions of OfficeJet and OfficeJet Pro printers. This posed on your screen as the normal update that you would normally get that says, uh, you have a critical security update waiting for you, click OK to install it. And after you clicked OK, your printer did a thing and rebooted, just like everything else that you've ever installed, and then nothing changed that you could see. But inside the printer, something new was happening. There was a <coughs> clock ticking down to September. Six months later, the clock reached zero, and all of those printers started rejecting third-party ink cartridges, because that's what you've just installed, was code to allow the manufacturer to require you to arrange your affairs <coughs> to, their, to their shareholder benefits by buying your ink at a price that was more expensive than vintage Veuve Clicquot instead of buying it for pennies. Uh, and um, the HP didn't even tell people what they'd done when they did this. The people just started noticing that their printers were malfunctioning. A lot of people threw their printers out because they might have had five or six known good sets of cartridges because at the start of the school year they went to Costco and bought a, bought a case of them. And after three or four swaps, they just threw the thing out. Um, but eventually, after thousands of complaints, people figured out what they were doing. 
they had deliberately reached into millions of customers' uh, homes and broken their property to punish them for the sin of not using their products in a way that they preferred instead of the way that the owner of the product preferred. And um, they promised after getting caught that they wouldn't do it again, but in September 2017, they did it again, and Epson just did it. Once it's possible to use the DMCA to make a literal felony to use your property in ways that upset a company's shareholders, it's inevitable that you get more of it. So uh, uh, Philips has pushed firmwares to their smart light bulbs, uh, their smart light sockets to re reject third-party light bulbs. But the DMCA doesn't just give companies the right to dictate how you use a product. As I said, it gives, you, uh, it gives them the right to dictate who can look at a product, who can talk about that product. Disclosure of a defect in a system that has a technical protection measure for copyright might help someone remove that technical protection measure. And so companies have argued and have gone to court and have invoked the power of the state to arrest security researchers who uncover defects in their products and go public with them in ways that they disprefer. Right, so what company wouldn't like a monopoly over who can investigate and discuss and disclose defects in their products? So defects in these products, they fester. Right? They, they, it's not that if you suppress the, uh, the revelation that a product is defective, no one else independently rediscovers that fact. What happens instead is those defects are independently rediscovered not by security researchers who want to warn customers, but by a different kind of security researcher, the kind of security researcher who wants to make money by creating cyber weapons that they either sell to governments or to criminals or both. And eventually these reach a critical threshold where the, um, enough people are being exploited through this vuln, through this vulnerability, that the manufacturer can no longer deny it. This is the worst of all possible worlds. And, and to make it even worse, what security researchers are doing now in large numbers is rather than keep silent or warn the manufacturer and face the risk of sanctions, they're just dumping the vulnerabilities they find on pastebin anonymously because they, they figure that that's better it's better that the news be out there now for everyone, including criminals, to see and for the, for the starter pistol to be fired to see how many criminals can exploit it before the manufacturer can patch it, than to turn it over to the manufacturer who then suppresses it until it's so widely exploited that they can't deny it anymore. So remember those Philips light bulbs. They use a, a protocol called Zigbee to network with each other. In, in, September, in November 2016, uh, researchers from Dalhousie in uh, Nova Scotia and the Wiseman Institute in Israel uh, disclosed a defect in, in Zigbee uh, that showed that they could use uh, a drone to infect all the Zigbee light bulbs in a city in five minutes. Uh, and then once they'd infected all those light bulbs, they could use them as an entry point into, into people's lands and use them to attack all the devices on their local networks, their smart phones, their cameras, their, their, their baby monitors, and so on. Um, and that's because every one of those devices is a computer, right? A light bulb today is a computer in a fancy case with uh, an LED in it. Uh, and so every device that's insecure and connected to your network is an attack surface. So remember, HP is now pushing uh, malicious updates to its printers. There's a lot of ways that that can go wrong, but one of them is that um, they're now designing printers to resist user inspection, and that means that malicious tools that run on them can get a lot further. And we've seen what, what malicious stuff can do with printers. There's a researcher named Ong Kui, who in uh, 2011 gave a paper at the Chaos Communications Congress called Print Me If You Dare. So it turns out that the way HP printers receive new uh, operating systems firmware updates is you send them a print job. And then in the print job is an instruction that says, this is new software. And the printer just dutifully ingests the software, throws away its old operating system, and puts the new one in with no checks. They've made it a little better since, not much better. So Kui showed that he could send your HR department a file called resume.doc, and after they printed it, it, your printer would be irrevocably tasked to him that its new operating system would accept future updates and update the little number on the screen to show you that it had been successfully installed. They just wouldn't do anything with them. And meanwhile, it would crawl your network, identify all computers with known vulnerabilities inside your network, take them over, open a reverse shell to his laptop, and exfiltrate all the data on your network through your printer. He didn't even have to trick your HR department because he found something like four million printers that were on the public internet that he could just send print jobs to and take over all of them and then all the networks that they were connected to. It gets worse, right? Cloud pets, uh, February 2017. So a cloud pet is a soft toy with a computer. 
Uh, it's got a it's got a, a a Wi-Fi interface and a microphone and a uh, speaker. You put it on your LAN, you pair it with an app on your phone, and you give it to your kid. And then your kid uh, and you can communicate with it. Your kid squeezes it and says, I love you, mommy. Your app chimes on your phone, and you hear it, and you say, I love you back, kiddo, and out it comes. So CloudPets was a division of a publicly listed Romanian company that had lost 98% of its share value. Um, and uh, researchers had discovered repeatedly that CloudPets was storing all of these messages along with all of their customer details, including passwords, on an unpassword protected Amazon uh, Web Services virtual computer. They repeatedly contacted the manufacturer, but no one worked there anymore. There were two million of these deployed in the field. And not only did the database have a lot of messages from people who said, I've stolen your database, send me some Bitcoin or I'm going to release it. Lots of them, old ones that no one had read. <laughs> But it had a lot of sensitive material because these things aren't just used to say, I love you, mommy, I love you too, kiddo. They're used to say things like, don't worry, mommy will come from home from the hospital soon. And those sat there on this unprotected web server. And the researchers had known that these were there, but they didn't tell anyone about it because they were worried about DMCA liability. And months went by before they finally reached the breaking point and went public with it. It gets worse. Nanny cams. Nanny cams are super insecure. Uh, you can hardly go six months without seeing some kind of horrific nanny cam exploit. My favorite one is January 2016, San Francisco, a, a 48 hour news blip, because this mom kept, uh, her three year old kept complaining that the cell phone in his room or the phone in his room, which is what he called the nanny cam, was uh, scaring him at night with noises. So one night she's walking past her kid's door and she hears some rando swearing at her kid through the nanny cam and she walks in and it's one of those ones with the steerable cameras that you control with an app and the camera swivels around to look at her and a stranger's voice says, uh oh, mommy's here. And she never heard the voice again, right? The temptation to network devices to put sensors in them and then to add a technical protection measure that makes it illegal to audit them it is endless. CES 2016, the Internet of Things rectal thermometer. <laughs> no orifice left unplugged. We literally have this stuff up the ass. Now, companies don't do this stuff because they want you to be insecure. They do it because they're pursuing uh, petty, illegitimate advantage in the marketplace, and they're indifferent to the security implications. Um, so. Every company would like the ability to stop new competitors from blocking, uh, from, from creating services that disrupt their markets. When Netflix started putting DVDs in red envelopes and mailing them around the world, the Motion Picture Association claimed that it was a copyright infringement, which was just wrong on its face. And they would have loved to have shut it down. And Netflix kept saying, we bought it, we own it, we get to do what we want with it. But um, after the uh, admiral, uh, the pirate had become an admiral, uh, Netflix, uh, decided that they wanted to stop their competitors from doing the same thing to them that they had done to the movie studios. So they, along with other large rights holders, went to one of the preeminent uh, open standards bodies in the technology world, the World Wide Web Consortium, which spent a quarter of a century making open standards for the web that ensured that anyone could implement a web browser uh, that could load and run any content that we had on the web. And they convinced them that we needed to start creating these technical protection measures that were standardized in web browsers because it was about to get really hard to do this. We had uh, taken away all of the interfaces that, um, that the earlier versions of this stuff, like Flash, had been using because they were so insecure. And it was going to have to be the case that, that Netflix and their rivals were going to have to transmit in the clear uh, or uh, um, trust their users, right? Not run code on their computer that the users couldn't inspect. And um, that uh, um, would have also, not incidentally, given them the power to stop people from implementing any technology that was legal, but that they dispreferred. Because in order to implement a technology, for example, that was a PVR for your Netflix movies, or that did some other function Netflix didn't like, but which was otherwise lawful for you, um, Netflix, uh, you, you would have to bypass this technical protection measure, this digital rights management tool, which in the W3C context was called um, encrypted media extensions. So we at EFF, we went there and we, we tried to say, this is not a fit subject for standardization. And we, we argued that they should just abandon the project. And that was a non-starter. They said, we're an organization of compromise, come back with a compromise. 
We said, all right, we're going to come back to the compromise. You've told us that the reason you need this is to protect your copyrights. So here's the compromise. You have an existing regime that says that if you have one kind of intellectual property right, if you have a patent and you attend the W3C and you standardize something, you have to promise never to use that patent to stop someone from making the thing you just standardized. So let's take this and extend it to, uh, to this encrypted media extensions. If you have the right to stop someone from making a technology because of the DMCA, you have to promise not to use it unless there's some copyright infringement going on. So you can use it to stop all the copyright infringement. In fact, we went more than that. We said any enumerated statute, copyright, trademark, trade secret, tortious interference with your customers and your contracts, any of those things, you can invoke the DMCA. What you can't do is use it to stop someone from conducting a security audit of a browser that three billion people use to control their Internet of Things devices, to uh, uh, do their banking, to talk to their family, to uh, communicate with their doctors, to, to get their education, and so on. What you can't do is invoke it to stop someone from implementing a feature that helps someone with a disability gain accessibility. So for example, I have a, a friend, um, she works in, in the mailbox where I get my mail. She has photosensitive epilepsy, and the only time she's ever been hospitalized by it was watching a Netflix video where a strobe effect triggered five consecutive Gromel seizures that hospitalized her. It's not hard to implement a buffer for Netflix that just looks ahead and checks to see whether there's a strobe coming up and then pauses it and says, there's some strobing coming up, maybe look away or advance it, or I can mute the, I can, I can dim the amount of strobe or whatever, right? There's lots of ways you can manage that. You have to promise not to use it against competitors who are doing to Netflix what Netflix did to the Motion Picture Association. Right, the, the, the tomorrow's pirates who will dream of being admirals in 20 years. And they rejected this in every one of its iterations. They rejected the idea of protecting security researchers, even a very, very narrow proposal that said we should only, you, you should just only promise not to sue security researchers who discover defects in this that affect the privacy part of the spec. The Netflix representative, within half an hour of that proposal being made, came onto the public list and said, we will not discuss this. Um, in the end, an organization that had never published a standard except through consensus published this one with a 58% majority. And they imbued to the browsers used by 5 billion people an unauditable attack surface and a technology that can't be adapted for people with disabilities, that can't be adapted for competitors. Um, and they did it, I think, because like every other domain, we've seen enormous consolidation and the firms that uh, at one point were scrappy upstarts have now become the, uh, the uh, great entrenched powers. And it's like the last scene of Animal Farm. You look from the pigs to the farmers and you can't tell the difference anymore. And ultimately, the browser vendors who had historically been advocates for openness here sided with, with the motion picture studios. And that was true of Mozilla and it was true of Google and it was true of Apple and it was true of Microsoft. Uh, the only one who spoke out for us was Opera. Uh, or rather, not opera, brave. Opera didn't in the end. And so what we ended up with was universal, unified front on the part of the, the large corporate members. And the W3C has apparently become a, uh, a creature of those members. So when your devices don't obey you, when the dead hand of the manufacturer lies on your devices waiting to smack you upside the head for failing to arrange your affairs to its benefit, you are no longer the owner of your, owner of your property. You are its tenant. And we have a system, a name for that system, where only a small number of people are allowed to own property and everyone else has to use it to the benefit of those owners. It's called feudalism, mm. right? But historically, feudalism at least had a human aristocracy at the top. Our new feudalism, it has these transhuman immortal colony life forms called limited liability corporations that treat us alternately as food sources or as uh, inconvenient gut flora. So when we are one vision system away from a toaster that rejects third-party bread, and one RFID away from a dishwasher that won't wash third-party dishes, and when it's a felony to reconfigure them, we are headed for some very bad times. The DMCA draws no distinction between the rule that says you can't bypass the technical protection measure in your iPhone to install a third-party app store and bypassing a technical protection measure that says you can't use third-party bread. Enough is enough. 
I'd like to propose something to you today called a Ulysses Pact. Uh, this is a thing that comes out of behavioral economics and refers to the classics, so you being academics, you'll, you'll like this. Uh, Ulysses, as we know, was a hacker. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> there was an established protocol for sailing through the Sea of the Sirens, whose song would tempt men to jump in and, and drown. Uh, that established protocol was to plug your ears, ears up with wax, but that's no fun, right? Uh, Ulysses wanted to hear the song and survive it. He wanted to do something no sailor had done before. So he came up with an awesome hack. He had his sailors lash him to the mast so that in his moment of weakness, he could not be tempted because he had taken a countermeasure in his moment when he was strong. And the Ulysses Pact in the behavioral economics context is when you throw away the, all the Oreos the night you start your diet, mm -hmm. right? Or um, when you uh, uh, put a lock on your phone that doesn't let you uh, look at Facebook during business hours, or any of the other things that you do to help strong you protect yourself from weak you in the future. And I want to propose the Ulysses Pact to all of you as users of technology, as practitioners, as, uh, as scholars, as instructors, as future professionals in various kinds of, of industries that will interact with technology. And it's in two parts. The first part is that devices should always obey their owners. So anytime there's a conflict between the orders that the owner of the device is giving and any other party, law enforcement, manufacturers, rights holders, anyone in the world is giving that device, the device should always obey their owner. Not because this can't go horribly wrong. This can go horribly wrong. But it goes less horribly wrong <laughs> than designing a device that has some spyware running on it that tries to stop the owner from overruling how the device works. The second one is that it should always be lawful to disclose defects in devices under every circumstance, not because you can't disclose irresponsibly. There are lots of irresponsible ways to make disclosures. It's really easy to be a jerk with security information. But because true facts about systems are protected speech, because companies are not good custodians of bad news about their own products. And I ask you to pledge to be hardliners for this, to never contribute to products, designs, or activities that undermine these principles. If they don't call you an, un, uh, an unrealistic extremist in your adherence to these principles, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> Software is eating the world, and it's because of general purposeness. Every device is a computer attached to an exotic peripheral, an airplane, an insulin pump, an operating theater, a nuclear missile. And the W3C was the canary in the coal mine. Are our existing open institutions still strong enough to resist the forces of control, reaction, greed, and depraved indifference? That's not a fight we win on our own. It's a group effort. We need you. We need to teach the practitioners of tomorrow to, and imbue them with the sense of gravitas of their mission. Because the things that they do with computers will make them the animators of every object in our lives. We can no longer allow these bad metaphors to flourish even if they make for com con convenient tools for simplifying complicated ideas. Now, lucky for us, we were approaching an important point in every one of these big policy struggles, the moment of peak indifference. That's long before most people care about the problem, but it is the point at which the number of people who care about the problem or acknowledge that there is a problem only goes up. It goes up for a terrible reason. It goes up because the problem has gotten so advanced that it can no longer be denied. Right? We've, we've passed peak indifference with climate change. There will never be less tangible evidence that climate change is real than there is today, and there will be never be fewer people who've been adversely affected personally by it. And so from now on, while we do have to kind of do some stuff around the margin to get the climate deniers on board, mostly what we have to do is convince people who now know that there is a problem with the climate, that there might be a solution to not give in to climate nihilism. And the same is true of privacy nihilism, of computer nihilism, of security nihilism that from now on, the number of people who adversely affect problems with computer security that are the hangovers from this metaphor debt, it only goes up. And so from now on, really what we're doing is we're trying to convince people that we can solve these problems. So if we lose these fights, we lose everything. And it's a pretty crappy dystopia where entertainment law turns into the thing that drives us into full apocalypse mode when we get Huxley into the full Orwell. <laughs> <laughs> now, the world has more important problems than the destiny of the internet. Uh, climate change, gender and racial equality, wealth inequality, and so on. But those fights, they're fights that we win or lose on the internet. If we don't have a free, fair, and open internet infrastructure, we can't fight any of those fights. 
Metaphors cost something. It's a metaphor to say information wants to be free, but information doesn't want to be free. I, I actually wanted to get to the bottom of this. So uh, I went uh, for a weekend in the country with information. We went out to Mendocino. Uh, we, we rented a, a, a place in a, in a hotel that had a sweat lodge. We drank Cabernet. We talked about our fathers. We cried. At the end, information took me in this like strong, manly hug. I felt its stubble scratch my cheek. I smelled the smoke in its hair, and information whispered its dirtiest secret to me and said, I don't want to be free, I just want people to stop anthropomorphizing me. <laughs> because information doesn't want anything, but people want to be free. And in an information age, you can't make people free without a free, fair, and open information uh, infrastructure. The people who saw the power of computers 25 years ago, people who founded things like um, uh, Sunsight, which became iBiblio, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the W3C, they didn't found these organizations and institutions because they thought that the internet was automatically going to be amazing. They founded them because they were very keen uh, appreciators of the risks. Their motto was not, this is all going to be so great. Their motto was, this is going to be great if we don't screw it up. As Aaron Swartz said, it's no longer okay for our politicians not to understand how technology works. So if you know how the internet works, you have a duty to find ways, not just to make it easier for the people around you to use technology, but to help them understand it. Because the foreseeable future is going to be filled with people pressurizing us to make bad metaphors real, to break crypto, to implement digital rights management, to denutralize the internet, and we have to fight them. With the help of everyone, we can fight them, because we all depend on the internet, the nervous system of the 21st century, and the race between indifference and the point of no return is up for grabs, and we can help pick the winner. There are organizations all over the world that work on this stuff. There's Creative Commons, Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Free Software Foundation. There's the Electronic Frontier Alliance, which organizes campus groups all around the world. And if you want to know more about that, you can uh, email me, Corey, at EFF.org, and I'll tell you more about it if you want to start one here. And they need your support, and not just in the form of memberships and donations, but we need your support to help, win us, to help us win this race between peak indifference and the point of no return to build the future in which computers are programmed by people and not the other way around. Together, I think we can realize that. Thank you.